Okay, our next item on the agenda is uh, Mark Van Holly's economic development proposal. Uh, Mark, if you would, I'm, I'm going to give you about 20 minutes on this particular proposal. I know last time we went almost an hour. And yes. we have some other meetings behind this that are scheduled, so okay. we're going to have a little bit of time frame today. Well, unfortunately, you guys know I've been clocked to speaking three or four hundred words, but the game we missed to five, six hundred, so we might break some new records today well, to get through it in 20 minutes' time. I'm going to ask you to speak in a tone <laughs> which we can keep up and listen and understand. I will. People in the audience today can actually keep up with Absolutely. Also. And and there are a number of folks here in the audience that would like to add their voice, and I've mentioned this to uh, uh, Commissioner Dyer um, a few days ago and also to Dan Jordan a few days ago. So all As time allows. I'm sorry? As time allows. Okay. Well, there are a number of community leaders that see the value in this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I'll hand these out, and uh, in respect of the limited amount of time that we have, you know, this is the and, and in fairness to, to Commissioner Bidenthal and, and to Dan Jordan, they sat through this uh, presentation back in October, and a number of things have obviously changed from that time till now. Uh, but you know, the other commissioners haven't had the benefit of this information, and we're talking about a community where the wages are bottom four percent lowest in the country, and the like, participation rate is about the lowest in the United States of America, right here, right now. So, it's a significant issue that I think is worthy of the, the time that we should take to um, to look at this and really analyze it, and understand it. So, since we have such a limited amount of time, I'm going to fly in this really fast because, again, there's other folks here that would like to address these issues. Things that define Southern Oregon's economy. We've got some agriculture, some timber, we've got a university, we've got a college, we've got retirement, we're a nine county shopping mecca. Uh, all these things put together, we're still bottom four percent lowest wages in the country. What we've got going on isn't getting the job done as far as creating a strong foundation of family wage jobs that will create an economic multiplier that will benefit and lift up this whole country and create new streams of tax revenue for the county and other jurisdictions. Uh, I, I would like to commend the county. The county. There's a lot of things going on. This is all negative. You know, look at the airport. We've got a wonderful airport. We've got uh, freeway interchange. We've got great libraries. We've got great co uh, college, university, higher education center, new high schools. You know, there's a lot of things that are going on here. We've got world-class culture and health care. Uh, all those things are wonderful, but the one thing that we're missing that we haven't accomplished is building the strong foundation of family with jobs since the decline of the timber industry. I think some people right now might see me this way in the community as a bit of an agitator. And I won't, I won't deny that I'm definitely an agitator, but I think that sometimes in life we need a little bit of agitation. And I'm hoping that uh, that's not really how I'm coming across. I think I'm just more of a device for stirring and shaking things up. And I'm hoping what we've got here, you guys, is the proverbial grain of sand inside the oyster, that the oyster gets just irritated with enough to do something really special with it. Uh, I knew about five years ago that there was something amazing going on with the tech sector in, in this area, but didn't know exactly what that was. We started Sustainable Valley at the height of the recession. Some people might think that Sustainable Valley is, is not getting the traction that it should uh, five years into its creation. I wouldn't totally disagree with that, but I resigned from that organization about, uh, I don't know, last summer to avoid any appearance of conflict of interest. But we knew something was going on, and for heaven's sake, it was the height of recession. We need to do something different than what we were doing because of the way our community was hurting. But there is something amazing going on in the tech sector. You know, the community knows that we're not making the, the, the right investment, and subsequent to this article, there have been additional investments made in economic development, but we kind of have the never-ending self-fulfilled prophecy of self-imposed limitations specific to our foundation of family wage jobs. And again, that's the whole thing I'm talking about here today. So we have a roadmap to regional economic resiliency, and I think it's safe to say we need a roadmap because we're not economically resilient. The county is. Fiscally, I think that this county is to be commended because if we're not the strongest out of 36 counties, we're one of the strongest as far as the county government is concerned, but as far as the citizenry is concerned, we're not. Uh, but I think a lot, a lot of that's because we're not really aware of our current uh, long-term social economic challenge. I say we, the people in this room are, but by and large, folks aren't or they're in denial about them. But we have to start there in order to understand our opportunities that we need to nurture and leverage to transform the economy. We know that we have video poker proceeds that are earmarked by state statutes specifically for economic development. Very long list of justifiable expenditures, but the first thing it says is job creation. Halfway down the list it says public education. So with the library levy passing, and I think that was the idea of the Jackson County Commissioners, uh, that's a great, it worked, the citizens backed it and supported it. So there's other investment options for these video poker proceeds to create jobs, uh, which we haven't been getting that traction. Statewide average for other counties that have economic development enterprises and what they invest from that source is about 35%. We've been, um, before, before this last fall, we were at about 10% uh, of that. The cities tell another story. The cities that, that are dark support 
uh, our primary go-to economic development agency to the tune of about 38 cents per capita annually. Uh, investment in economic development. The cities in white uh, support Bend. At the time I put this together last year, Bend was outpacing our job growth five to one. They invest two dollars and thirty-eight cents per capita compared to what we were doing with thirty-eight cents. So we're not getting what we're not paying for. Talked about some current challenges. Our MSA right now, we're on a list of the top 179 best performing small cities, but we've plunged 52 places over the last five years. We're 91 out of 179. That's what the analysis is based upon. We're 140 for uh, five-year job growth, 147 for short-term job growth, 163 for wage growth, and it's actually a lot worse than this. We were number 12 10 years ago. We've fallen 79 places. You can't make this stuff up. And I want to I be objective and real about it and say, why? Why have we fallen? Why are other cities outperforming ours and, and outpacing us? This actually shows you, and again, it's not all bad. Now, the six metro markets in the state of Oregon, year-to-year -year, uh, job growth, we were, the majority of last year, we were bringing up the rear, but we've moved up quite a bit. So we're second to Bend out of six metro markets. But I'll let you know, out of, out of all 50 states for the labor participation rate, which defines your workforce between the age of 16 and 64, with 50 being low, Oregon is currently number 49. And our county is bringing up the rear, and out of 36 counties, we're number 30. So even though that looks good, our whole state is far more stagnant than the rest of the country is. Unemployment rates, Oregon, and I'm sorry, I'm going to turn this light out because it's hard to see, but that's all right. Oregon unemployment rates 11% above the U.S. average. We're 35. Josephine County is 51% above the U.S. average. Our wages, Oregon's wages are about 10% below the U.S. average. We're 26% below. That puts us in the bottom 4% for the lowest wages in the country. And the metrics is the 334 largest counties in the United States. Jackson County was holding steady at number 311. We slipped to number 320. There's only 14 counties between us and the end of the list of 334 uh, for the lowest wages in the country. And I think that we're in a bit of a death spiral because the primary jobs that we're creating are not family wage jobs. Jackson County, or Josephine County is not on that list. If they were, they'd be bringing up the rear of their wages of 15% less than ours. Historically, we trail Washington. They're about 8% above. We're about 10% below. It's about a 20% swing, a 20 point swing. Mark McMullen, state economist, said, I wrote an article last year, I called him and said, I want to make sure I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly. He said, basically, in rural Oregonian communities, when your death rate exceeds your birth rate, you're in trouble. And these are things that, that folks are not necessarily aware of or tracking, and it's going to have a significant impact. I asked him, I said, Mark, do you think we're not considered, we don't consider ourselves a rural economy, but do you think that's happening in Southern Oregon? He said, yes, you just don't know about it. Here's a couple of slides that validate that. In 1980, Jackson County had two births for every death. We're at the break-even point. 1980, Josephine County had one and a half births for every death. They're less than half that right now. We're not replacing our, our younger generation, which is our future workforce and leaders in this community. This shows you over a three-year period of time, Jackson County grew about 3,000 people. Josephine County only grew about 100. There's your, your death and birth ratio imbalance. We're only about 355 ahead. Jack, Josephine County is about 1,200 down. But what we've got, we've got this net inward migration. Over three years, 2,749 people migrated into Jackson County. If you add those two numbers together, about 3,000 increase in population, only 10% of that is because our birth ratio is staying ahead of the death ratio. So what's going on here, we've got, we're a very attractive community for retirees. We've got old folks moving in one side of the valley, and I'm getting old too, so nothing against old folks here. Uh, old folks moving in one side of the valley while the young folks are moving out the other side of the valley. But this gives us a false sense of security because like, hey, we grew 3,000 people, but nobody's tracking the demographics. And if they are, there's not much of discussion going on. It's like two a week. So all we can do is get more mental health interventions that can reparent our kids because parents are living on the edge. This tells me, look, 56% of the kids in our school district and 65 in Grants Pass, those kids represent young families. That tells me the majority of young families with school-aged children in our community are struggling to put food on the table. And I know it's as unacceptable to you guys as it is to me. I realize I'm preaching to the choir here too, but it's good choir practice. Our payer mix, which defines your private sector insurance contribution to overall health care costs, 27% below Oregon's average, 37% below the U.S. average. Low wages includes low benefits. Higher wages, higher benefits. I told you about the labor participation rate. This state is bringing up the rear in the uh, country, and our county is 30 out of 36 counties. So our labor participation rate is about the lowest in the country right here, right now. This is not about recreating California. We know the majority of our land is controlled by the federal government. We've got the most restrictive zoning overlay of all 50 states, and we live in a bowl that traps the air, so we've got significant challenges on how we can grow our economy. We have to do it in ways that doesn't cause atmospheric emissions. If we're not okay with where we are, we've got to decide we're not going to stay here. 
So now we'll talk about some opportunities. Out of 22 sectors of technology, our community has 20 right now. That's significant. 11 of those are concentration levels approval at the national average of seven exceed. So without us really knowing about it, doing anything to nurture it or leverage it, we've got this strong tech sector that's been coming on high in plain sight that we can and should leverage. So one area is, uh, one positive signs are high tech sector output growth relative to the national average. So on that list where we're free falling on the top 179 best performing small cities, bringing up the rear of job and wage growth, we're number 15 for our five year high tech GDP growth. And I looked at that when I first saw it and said, an outside economic development think tank knows that about our community. Why don't we know about ourselves? And now that we do, what are we going to do about it? We've got a slightly lower concentration, but the diversity is greater than the US average. We're 72 for our one-year high-tech GDP growth. The reason I put that on there, there's a real disconnect between being 72 and 15. 72 tells me we're not aware of what's going on and we're not doing anything to leverage it. How many high-tech firms are record in Southern Oregon? When I ask people in a group setting, most people guess 5, 10, 15, 20. There's 277 defined by government day sector code. 2,753 jobs that average about $56,000. That's 150% of our current median wage. That's $154 million in actual payroll. A realistic multiplier is three. That's a half a billion dollar impact on our regional economy, and yet we haven't really done anything about it. This shows you, and I won't go through the details here, that the two-county region, government, they stuck the code, industry sector, the number of companies, jobs, uh, total payroll, and the wage per job. Josephine County, uh, 500 jobs that average about $60,000 in high tech. Jackson County has got uh, aggregated because of the shortness of time. We've got 277 companies, 2,750 jobs, and $56,000 wages. Uh, manufacturing, every new manufacturing job we bring to our community will have a 1.4 jobs multiplier, 1.4 more jobs, another teacher, doctor, waiter, clerk, whatever, uh, realtor. <laughs> uh, high tech manufacturing has a 4.3 jobs multiplier. And people say, well, that's the Silicon Valley, not the Rogue Valley. I'd say, use that same line of reasoning, cut both of those in half, which would you rather have? The high tech manufacturing has a higher, better quality of, of, uh, of, of job multiplier than the lower tech manufacturing. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. In 2003, we had about 100 people making about $2,500 a month doing computer system design and related services. Only 10 years <coughs> later, we doubled the workforce to over 200, and those folks have doubled their income to over $5,000 a month. That's pretty significant. And that's a microcosm of what happens in Silicon Valley, but it's our reality. We could do more of that. There's a random sampling of local tech companies going all the way from Merlin to Ashland and Jacksonville. They're all over the place. Historically, in our country, regardless of the level of education, the, uh, the manufacturing sector pays higher than the non-manufacturing sector. And we've got land that's been sitting vacant for decades, you guys. You know that. I'm not telling anything you already know. We have a technically educated workforce capacity we have not tapped into. Out of the eight Oregon universities, there's a number of students enrolled in each from Jackson, Josephine County. Over 300 consistently at OIT, uh, Oregon State, University of Oregon. We've got hundreds of kids that are getting great technical educations, and most of them are taking those educations and going to build the economy somewhere else. And there's multi-generational impacts because they'll have their kids somewhere else. They continue to get educated and build the economy somewhere else. And to paint with a broad brush, we're left over with the generation of kids that are acclimated to a mindset of scarcity and entitlement. And that's having multi-generational impacts right now. Now we'll talk about the transformation. It's been a dream of mine. It's no surprise you know, about transforming our economy and focusing on tech. Uh, there was an article that ran last year about uh, doing a tech park out on uh, Avenue G. We've got a great entrepreneurial system. Uh, this, Co this Mary Coffin Foundation ranks us number 16 out of 180 for entrepreneurialism. Our chambers obviously do great work. We have so many that does uh, amazing work. They do. Uh, Sustainable Valley's got a business accelerator, Jefferson Great Fund. We've got our RCC and SOU, SBDCs, Angel Investment. Look at all this together, it's like, well, what's going on? Why are we still in the bottom 4% for the lowest wages in the country? Why is our labor participation rate the lowest in the country? Those are questions I want to be objective and introspective and ask me, and it's obvious we're not firing all cylinders. We've got some challenges, and, and part of this is perception, not reality. State and local individual tax collections, with one being bad, Oregon ranks fifth worst in the country, or worst in California. But we're one of three states that doesn't have a sales tax, and if you could aggregate the impact of a sales, local, and income tax, we wouldn't be ranking quite as bad as we are. Tax freedom day, that proverbial last day of the year when all of your income goes to taxation, would be a little better. We're 16, California's four. We don't have a sales tax. I'm only looking at California right now. They're averaging 8.5% roughly. The big metro markets I'm targeting, Los Angeles and Silicon Valley, are closer to 10%. There's a huge affordability gap that currently works in our favor between the Silicon Valley and the Rogue Valley. A job that would pay $70,000 a year would be awesome. 
That'd be about twice the median income. But that same job would only pay about 91,000 in the area. You can make 107 to maintain your standard of living. That gap works in our favor right now. And I say right now because we've got the equity refugee pipeline open back up again. My wife and I, just about every other person in this community, flowed through that pipeline. When we came here in 2002, Medford, Oregon, and the surrounding area, all of Jackson County, was ranked the number one least affordable housing market in the United States of America because of the disparity between our low stagnant wages and our high real estate values. When the economy tanked, we overcorrected, the economies rebounded, housing starts are down, equities up, the house we sold for 450000 in Fremont, or Union City is selling for 750000 Okay, so that equity reduction pipelines, we've got realtors here. Uh, that can address that is open back up and all it's going to do if we don't adjust our stagnant wages is push more and more of our young people out of here. Uh, stat, state tax, uh, business, business tax climate, I'm as guilty as anybody else of drinking the negative Kool-Aid about Oregon, but the reality is if one being good, Oregon almost makes the top 10 for business taxation. We're number 12, California's 48. There's our opportunity. Overall business ranking 17 for Oregon is nothing to write home about, but it's a whole lot better than 47, which is where California's at. This is a very desirable place to live. In 2013, the number one inward migration state for United Airlines customers was Oregon. Out of all 50 states, we were number one. More than 150,000 Californians migrated in Oregon from 2000 to 2010, representing more than four billion in income. So the question is, that our Californians coming? They're absolutely coming. It's part of keeping Oregon green, especially Southern Oregon. The question is, can we be more strategic about who we attract to help transform our economy? I think that we can. So my plan is relatively simple. But that was our workforce in 2007. That's what it was at the end of 2013. We were down about 7,000 uh, jobs since the start of the Great Recession. We've adjusted subsequently since then. The numbers just came out a couple of days ago by a couple thousand, but we also increased our workforce. So the plan is relatively simple. And this is something I want to play off of what Danny Jordan and I have discussed over the last three months since this thing has been evolving. But Danny suggested that the county could potentially come in as a partner, one reasonable place to start is with a third of what I had raised overall uh, for this high-tech business recruitment campaign. So I show you two different slides. One here is based upon, let's get started right now with about $180,000. I have 120 from other uh, stakeholders. 60 from the county would be $180,000. That's what these numbers are based on. There's our current uh, number of jobs, our wage rate, we have about $3 billion in income. 471 jobs uh, would be with 64,000 would add 30 million in direct payroll. There's a 4.3 jobs multiplier. This is in your in your handout, so I won't go over this in greater detail. But we could add 106 million dollars in payroll that's not here in this valley right now by getting started. At 1% with the full 300,000 dollar original funding goal, it would have about 178 million dollar impact just in payroll in this valley. Here's our top nine high-tech sectors. It's not smoke and mirrors and wishful thinking. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Electronic instant manufacturing, five companies, 186 jobs, 15 million. Those jobs average $80,000 a piece. A lot of those are in Josephine County, a community where they have a median wage of less than 32. We're about 37. I can find hundreds of those companies that, are, that fit the exact perfect target demographic that would fit within this county. Uh, in California and Los Angeles and the Silicon Valley markets. That's part of my secret sauce, and I'd be glad to share with you how I do that. Okay, so right now, the preliminary funding strategy example. If we get started with where we're at right now with my other stakeholders in Jackson County coming into 60000 that would be $180,000. The additional funding, if, if additional stakeholders come on board, will let us reach the full potential of that metrics. And so what I'm asking you guys, you know, we have, what, $800,000 of video poker proceeds, so already got an increase, they're about they're up over $200,000. You know, right now, I'm, I, even though I asked for originally a five-year commitment and the Board of Commissioners, Commissioner uh, Bridenthal was here, the only one at the time, agreed to uh, make a commitment of $100,000 based upon me being able to reach a total of three. Uh, even though that didn't happen because there's a lot of political things that go on in a community like ours where people undermine and sabotage and self-destruct, I call it the... Uh, the politics of self-sabotage, even though it didn't happen, $60,000 a year is, I'm not even asking necessarily for three years. If we break this up in quarters, that's $15,000 a quarter, okay? You'll judge me on a quarterly basis based on the performance metrics I'm about to show you. If I'm not doing what I said I was going to do, then cut me off, okay? But we need to do something. There's, the, there's our performance metrics based on $180,000 in funding, the number of companies that I would identify and reach out to, and the number that I would have up here for uh, visits, and um, that I would go down and visit, and they would visit. So again, because of the shortness of time, I'm not going to get into that in any greater detail, but that, that's the performance metrics. If I'm not doing what I said I would do, then you guys can judge me accordingly and cut me off. I'll be totally transparent and accountable with this process, and again, it's a quarterly thing. 
So the risk is $15,000 for a quarter uh, of a budget of 800,000 video poker proceeds, or an overall budget of $330 million for the county has. What's in it for the county? A reasonable investment, a legitimate investment for video poker proceeds is supposed to be to create jobs and we desperately need them. Uh, we can cut back on our, our own expenditures for county public health and our dependence on the federal government. My understanding is that the building over there and the, and the county health and ser uh, public services is going to help tens of thousands more people than it was originally anticipated it would because people here have such low wages they can't take care of themselves, so we got to get federal subsidies to help them do it. The fairgrounds, from my understanding, they're consistently in red, but go to a concert, it's only half attended. People don't have expendable cash in their pocket to support the fairgrounds. If they did, then the fairgrounds would do, probably be in black on its own. Leverage, there's other stakeholders. Tax revenue, and I'd asked Danny about this um, a few months ago. Right now, we're making $500 in tax revenue on average for every vacant industrial land, acre of land in our industrial stock. And for every $1 million in capital improvements, that would increase to $2,000, which is a way to create new streams of tax revenue. And it may not be as much as we'd like, but it's, it, it's, it's heading in the right direction. I don't think that's a reason to not do it. So what's unique about this proposal? There's leverage, there's stakeholder reimbursement. You know, my plan is to, and I've already got, I've got realtors here that are, that are agreeing with this. My plan is that these companies will allow me to represent them uh, with real estate transactions, and I will credit back the, my stakeholders up to 50% of what I make in a, in a particular calendar year. And the goal is to get away from the government subsidy as quickly as possible, maybe within a five-year period of time, but I've been able to reimburse the stakeholders. Uh, collaboration, got great relationships with, uh, with everybody at the local level. You know, we had an event at the Higher Education Center. Matter of fact, I'll show you photos here in a second, and there was a great turnout there. I've got the performance metrics. We need the jobs. We've got what it takes. This is uh, Project Spirit, we'll be codenamed Project Spirit, that I made an outreach to. They were up there for the governor's inauguration. I had them meet with several other state leaders on that day just a few short weeks ago. This is an event that we hosted. There were 72 people confirmed attendance. I invited, it was an invitation only, I invited about 70 people from our community, more than 50 attended. There was more than 20 representatives from the Silicon Valley firm that came up here, and two, two media representatives from South Korea. A number of the people that were in this room were there also, which is something I'm hoping the time will allow them to say something because you need to hear from somebody besides me. But they felt very welcome. This, and I was told that this was a historic event. This has never happened in this community, and to me it's a preview of coming attractions. There's a group shot that we took toward the end. And I invite each of you, by the way, just for the record, but you know, you schedule conflicts. I think uh, people were out of town, it just didn't work out, but everybody was invited to come. Uh, we were able to meet with uh, Commissioner Roberts. Thank you for being available to meet with us. We were able to meet with you when they were here. And I'm actually taking these folks next week, and I'm done with this. I'm taking these folks next week up to uh, Salem to meet with some additional leaders. And I also have business appointments set up with OHSU, with Providence Healthcare, and others where we're actually, you know, they're opening the door to talk about these, this economic gardening that we could do through this company, which could actually create an entirely new industry in Southern Oregon. It could be a game changer. And with that, I don't know if I got quite close to the 20 minutes, but I'll take, I've got to take any questions you guys have. Thank you. We'll get into that here in a second. You One bet. thing I think I, I heard you several times during this presentation, i got to clarify it, because there's a lot of people in the room listening to this. I think you're misrepresenting some things that I don't think people understand correctly. Uh, you've indicated that the video poker proceeds are identified for economic development, that that should be utilized in this particular case. Those proceeds have been identified in our budget and, are, and have already been appropriated authority, uh, accordingly. This is general fund support that you're asking for. You're asking for taxpayer dollars. You're not asking for video poker because that's part of already our, our budget that's been identified. So I want everybody here to understand that these are taxpayer dollars that are being talked about not state video poker. I'm sure. So uh, I don't think you're representing it accurately in that particular case, and I, and I would ask you to look at your presentation and modify that. I, I will, again, so Commissioner Wright, that's the first I've heard that. We should be looking at this type of stuff as one thing for future, but for current requests, appropriation requests is not appropriate. Got it. Understood. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open this up. But, uh, let me start with staff. Danny, if you have some uh, questions, you can start here. Oh, I don't have a question. I'm just trying to highly brought other people to, uh, to speak. And that's obviously the board's uh, desire if they wish to hear from other people. I, I do want to make a few corrections and some things that were stated once again because there are very many people here. Um, you know, Danny, can you speak up a little louder for those older people? Uh, 
I'm, sure I'm usually not accused of being too quiet. That's true. That's true. Uh, first of all, um, with regard to, I, I want to make a few more clarifications with regard to video lottery. Video lottery comes to the county and it is placed in our general fund. It gets treated like any other revenue, except for the state requires us through an accounting procedure to uh, identify which activities the county do, the county does, that qualifies those dollars for economic development. So it's general fund. If you go to the state's website, you will see almost every service the county does qualifies for an economic development. Public safety qualifies for economic development. It qualifies for economic development because if you don't have a safe community, most businesses really don't want to be there. Um, our libraries, educational purposes, did qualify for economic development. Our airport qualifies for economic development. So these funds have never been earmarked at what Mark has asked them to be earmarked for for going on five or six years now. He has continually, when he, when he just said this was the first he's heard of this, I was a little shocked at that, but he's continually advocated that those funds should be spent on the things that he believes they should be spent on. What I'm telling you is the law provides all sorts of options for the board to consider to spend those funds on. His statement about you know, the contribution that the county makes towards economic development is represented in terms of the so ready contribution, which is accurate. We have done, uh, contributed $26,000 a year. However, we've made all sorts of additional investments in economic development that he didn't mention, including Sustainable Valley, where we were the seed funders of that program at $50,000 a year, twice of what we fund so ready annually for two years, plus a $10,000 contribution. The board, previous boards of commissioners have made hundreds of thousands of dollars in investments in economic development for which the economic video lottery, economic development video lottery, lottery funds will qualify for. So it's not that the county isn't spending the equivalent of those funds on economic development. The prior board, for example, had a jobs grant program that spent $200,000 a year towards economic development, providing funding to businesses for uh, creating uh, trade sector jobs. So, I, you know, that, that's another uh, area in your presentation that I think isn't represented in a, in a true light. Fair, in a fair way. Mark has also argued multiple times that Deschutes County provides a certain amount of economic development funds per capita that Jackson County doesn't provide. That's actually accurate. Uh, I would agree with Mark. However, every county is funded differently, and I've explained this to Mark multiple times. If you look at Deschutes County, the county's aggregate tax rate, it's up over $5. It's close to $5.35 per thousand. Jackson County works under two dollars and one cent per thousand, so they have two and a half times the amount of money that we have just based on the aggregate tax <coughs> rate. Not only that, but they have a motel hotel tax, which in Deschutes County is very significant, which a large portion has to go towards economic development. We don't have a hotel motel tax in Jackson County, and we wouldn't have the base to support the kind of funding that Deschutes County develops from a hotel motel tax because of their, you know, uh, retreat and. You know, all of the developments they have that are outside of the city limits. Of the uh, so they have a, a lot more funding available to them to be able to invest than Jackson County has. Um, I would say, I agree with Mark, that we have managed our finance as well in Jackson County. So we do have a fund balance that is typically, in this case, has to be by law general fund. We can't take airport funds and get them to Mark, or we can't take road department funds and give them to Mark. So we do have funds available via a fund balance, not via an operating revenue. A big difference from us and other counties. Um, I will say, you know, I don't disagree with Mark's uh, numbers in comparing us to the, to the national um, information, but if the Secretary of State's done two audits on counties in Oregon uh, recently, within the last four years, five years. Uh, in that audit, it did show that Jackson County is in the top third uh, in the state for average wages. So yes, we have a depressed wage according to national comparisons, but for the state, we actually fare pretty well. Mark showed the growth, uh, you know, showing us now currently, because we've made some ground in uh, the second highest behind Deschutes County at the large kind of metro areas. Uh, we also have, while well, we have a, uh, we're in the top third for state, uh, uh, average for state wages, or for wages, we're also in the bottom quarter for tax rates. So considering the circumstances of the counties in um, we've done fairly well uh, in supporting economic development and in making investments in economic development. So I don't, I don't want to, you know, the county does all sorts of things that the public's not necessarily aware of around economic development. We 
for example, to Asante and made our tax exempt bond status available to them to borrow money. That meant a huge reduction in their debt to allow them to expand and grow. We do things like that all the time. Those aren't captured in March number and March numbers about making investments, but I can tell you it's millions of dollars of investments via savings by us stepping up and allowing that to occur. So I just don't want it to appear. Mark, Mark paints a pretty bleak picture around the need for this, and I don't disagree that this is a uh, potentially a good project. I've told Mark that himself. I've said that I don't necessarily agree that Mark may or may not be the right person to do it. My recommendation to the board would be if you want to recruit this kind of service that you would go out for a request for proposals and see what kind of uh, competition we would get. And that's most not meant to be a slap in the face towards Mark. Mark doesn't have a history of doing this. He has a history of being very uh, energetic about doing it. But uh, so, you know, that was that, that's the only place I would disagree with uh, Mark regarding that. And with regard, I don't, you know, when Mark pulled out his wallet, it was really thick. I want to see what's in that wallet, Mark. <laughs> I think you have enough money to attend uh, concerts for sure. I mean, I I've never seen a wallet that thick. Uh, but uh, <laughs> business cards. Where, where he said, you know, that we have, uh, you know, five, $500 per acre on industrial land that's not being utilized. I do want to clarify, the county doesn't have that. That may be the tax generated county-wide. The county, if we get a million dollars of investment, for every million dollars of investment that someone makes, we get about $2,000. So, uh, and I've explained this to Mark, and a lot of people don't understand this. Development in our county, uh, residential development, commercial development, actually costs the county more money than the tax we generate. Because our tax, permanent tax rate is so small, it, it's, it's less than what the cost of the services to deliver to those particular developments are. Industrial is the only place where we actually fare better, so it is a great argument around industrial, and I've explained this to Mark, um, because, not just because of the industrial development, because of the personal property that also usually gets taxed that goes along with the industrial development. And so I just want to clarify, pe people speak a lot about the money the county will get. The county collects the money for all of the taxing districts, the county doesn't give them. And if you have any questions, I'm welcome to ask. Those were just the notes I took from Mark's presentation. It has changed, I guess, for this board's purposes. You do need to know that um, Mark had previously made a presentation where the county agreed conceptually to support his request for $100,000. $60,000 of that was to be uh, compensation or wages to him. $40,000 was to be available for reimbursements for expenses related to the business activities that he's conducting. And that uh, conceptual agreement by the board was based on the fact that Mark presented he had two other major corporations at the time it was Safe Corporation and Asante that would sign on, that he believed would sign on, uh, each contributing a, an equal amount to the county. The prior board of commissioners asked me to draft a letter indicating the county conceptually supported this based on what his proposal was. Mark was informed at the time that you know that board was only going to be it was near the end of October when the presentation was made of last year, that that board would be out of office, you know, January, the beginning of January, and that that would need to be executed for that proposal to be uh, accepted by that board. The, a new board coming in would not have to agree to that proposal or not. Mark said that he would execute it. He was not able to do that. And, you know, Mark spoke to a lot of political things and reasons that, for things that happened. Uh, uh, and so we went along for several months believing that we would have entered into a contractual arrangement with him. Mark did talk about the fact that, you know, things have changed since then. They've changed fairly significantly because the proposal now uh, is for the county to contribute, I believe, 60000 based on what Mark said today. I don't know if that's to go to, towards Mark's wages or towards reimbursements for bit, uh, associated activities, so I'm not... Those were details we would probably want to find out before you agreed or didn't agree. Uh, and it's based on a, a matching contribution from five other individuals at 120,000 uh, race. And I don't know if that's divided equally among five people or that you know, there's one person given 60,000 and the other 60,000 is being split between the remaining four or what exactly that means. It does have an impact in terms of the difference between the county investing in this and private business people investing in this is that the county's records are public record. We have to make available to the public everything we do. None of the private businesses have to do that. Um, and for the, the last board's requirements uh, to agree to what they conceptually agreed to with Mark, they wanted to make sure that I could uh, manage financially and verify all of the data 
about who contributed what and who uh, was uh, how the reimbursements were being matched. That's easy to do when there's us and two other major companies. When you start bringing in multiple partners, it becomes a lot more difficult to manage. Uh, with this particular proposal, you know, at sixty thousand dollars, the amount of effort that would go into that, and frankly, I don't even know if it would be possible because, as I said, we can't necessarily compel private parties to provide all of their financial records to us to verify while we can be compelled to do that. Mark could contractually bind other parties to require them to do that if that was something that you wanted to do if they were going to participate. Mark has you know, separate agreements with some other people, and this may have changed since I've talked to Mark, where he's told them that if he brings in a large contributor, he would allow them to not have to fund this project. That wasn't an op 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 option made available to the county. It was just made available to some of the private party members. The last board said that they would not agree to that, that if there was going to be a reduction because of additional people coming on, that it would be shared equally across all parties. So Mark, I don't know if he's negotiating all of those things with the other people that he's agreed to have invested uh, into this. And you know, um, but with with the ask now of sixty thousand, I can tell you that managing that is taking my time to do that. Uh, <coughs> really doesn't seem to be uh, to pin all of those things down with all of the performance measures the board wanted and the uh, counting uh, requirements. That doesn't seem feasible to me. What seems feasible is that if you support this, that you would provide an appropriation to be done with it. I mean, frankly, just because you know, and if you want to do that on a quarterly basis, you can do that on a quarterly basis, like Mark said, so you don't have to overexpend. But to have all of these other conditions for ask for sixty thousand dollars. $15,000 a quarter uh, seems burdensome, cumbersome, and almost, as I said, impossible because of the circumstances of who the partners would be. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you, you ended, you were correct when you indicated that I'm the one sitting commissioner and was here from the uh, origination from your original proposal. And before I uh, ask the other commissioners to their opinion, I do need to say this. Your original proposal was for three partners, Jackson County being one of them. It was for about two hundred and seventy to three hundred thousand dollars total commitment, with an equal risk to each one of the partners. Within just a short period of time, it became very apparent that you were not going to be able to do that, and your proposal modified very quickly to be able to have multiple partners and brought that back and we met as a board. And we did say, okay, multiple partners, but it's still a 270 to $300,000 range. And the equal risk has to be shared between all partners. Within six months, this is, uh, we still have not received that proposal from you or be able to make that commitment. And this is the third proposal, which is reducing, again, your ability from the original proposal. So it's starting to have a little bit of that used car salesman type feel to it. And I, I think I just need to get it out there sure. and, be, uh, and be square and be straight up with everybody because, it, you know, I'm not going to pay the 300. I'm going to leave. I'm not going to buy the car. Wait a minute, I'll sell it to you for 60,000. Uh, it's kind of getting that feel. So I'm, I'm my original support of this is now weaning away because of the fact that I don't know what the final product is going to look like because we haven't been able to get to that point. Uh, everything that's been committed and promised at this point in time has yet to be delivered or even close enough to be delivered that I can get a clear picture of what's going on. Do you want me to respond to that? Well, uh, not yet. Okay. I mean, uh, I'm giving you, from my perspective, looking at this and just getting all the feedback and hearing about it and the different presentations and, and sitting through all these different meetings, this is where I'm at personally with this process. Uh, I want to get that out front and say that before I open the floor to the other commissioners and let them uh, make comment on your presentation. So that's the history piece of it. So based on the presentation that you saw today, and I know you have two fresh minds here that we're not part of that process. And, and if they agree to make the decision to support me today, that, that's your, your, that's great for you. If they agree to not support me today, that's part of the process also. But there's some other avenues here that we can discuss, maybe uh, sending it off to a, our economic development committee for uh, getting a better picture of it, something to consider. Um, 
letting them say, okay, let's refine this, let's let's figure out what we're going to do. Um, where is the money? These are taxpayer dollars, like I talked about earlier. I mean, these are this is the dollars coming out of people's homes, or the taxes on their homes. So, what's the best way to be able to spend those dollars to make sure that we are moving forward economically in the community? As you very eloquently pointed out, we are a retirement community. We know that. The nation knows that. California knows that. Uh, we don't have what's attracting or maintaining the youth. The birth rate is a result of the retirement community that we do so well of attracting and we've been marketing for for quite some time. So um, I don't think uh, portraying it as that is the main problem. We've actually been attracting that for quite some time to be our retirement community. And that's been some of the business plans from all the cities and the community quite, and the realtors that are in the room. That's how they make their money, to be able to recruit the retirees. They don't have kids that are really little. So that birth rate, you're right, it will continue to decline as long as we continue down that type of path. So with that being said, uh, Mr. Roberts, um, well, I'll um, just give you my opinion, and I have seen your presentation. You presented it to me just shortly after the election, and um, I was, I shared with you, I wasn't sure I would have acted then, mm -hmm. but, um, and I agree, I mean, I appreciate your energy and your passion, you're wanting to do something, and um, even bringing your clients up to meet me was uh, a real, um, a really special event for me, but um, for re and I agree with you, the jobs are falling, and wages are horrible, and businesses are closing. Um, whether or not I would support giving general fund dollars that belong to those people whose wages are falling and they're losing homes and they've lost their jobs. I'm not sure I can do that. I do question the fact that when I look back at minutes, like uh, RD Cog minutes from 2010, your, your, your pitch was the same. Let's build economic growth. And, the high-tech sector and, and get family wage jobs, and that was five years ago. And I'm not, I, I, I hope to, as a commissioner, see mar you know, marketable accounting results if that's an investment that we're making. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I, I just, I am more concerned, Mark, when I see so much business going out of our valley. And um, that's something I, I am passionate about, economic development. But when I see, we tried to contact Derek Gold when they were leaving, and we've got the skating rink that's gone, and Carousel Flowers from White City, and um, McLevin's from Jacksonville. I mean, all over our cities and our county, businesses are not making it. And it is my passion to figure out what government is doing, if it is anything we are creating, causing a problem. And until we fix what we've done, you won't be able to even do what you're trying to do. And I think the problem is with with our state and county and city um, out of out of line what they expect out of businesses and families trying to make go of it. Um, I there's things at Salem, I know there's a Central 611 that would fit right in with your program that's a benefit to technology coming into Oregon. And I think we need to look at those things that I intend to look at things in Jackson County. And maybe as we do that and we make some progress and I believe it's those small businesses that fill our shops back up, that high tech sectors and big companies will look, well, what's going on in the Rogue Valley? I want to move there. And I think that's the direction I want to come from, is building from what we have and, and attract from that. But um, I am a little skeptical about uh, using our general fund dollars for, for this focus of what you presented. But I appreciate your presentation. Well, I certainly appreciate your uh, enthusiasm, um, and I do think that in concept it's a great idea, and I think it can work to a certain degree. Um, one of my concerns is uh, duplication. We um, contracted with So Ready. So Ready is, is currently uh, engaged in doing exactly this. Uh, they're in negotiation with a company called 310 Limited to do exactly what we're talking about, and they have a uh, uh, guaranteed deliverable of six businesses that companies that have defined plan to be executed in the next uh, 48 months to, to relocate or expand, uh, or no timeline, maybe greater than 48 months, um, up to strategic 
introductions with companies, but, but six deliverables. The cost uh, to sell ready for this service, to guarantee six deliverable business is ten to $12,000. So my concern is, for one, duplication. Are we talking to the same people? Um, are these efforts you know, canceling each other out? And then bang for the buck as well. Um, like I say, so is doing this along with, with uh, pages of, of other types of economic development, one with business retention, of course, um, workforce development, all, all, the, all the things that we need to have done here. Uh, but we're, we're already engaged in that. The county's already invested in doing this. Um, so my concern, like I say, is our bang for the buck, how effective it will be because we're already, these efforts are already being uh, under, undertaken. And, uh, you know, how much, how much value are we going to get? The other thing that I, right now, you're at 120,000 with five investors here. You're a 24,000 average investor. Um, my question is, you know, why wouldn't Jackson County, if we want to be involved, why wouldn't, be, why wouldn't we be an investor at that level? We're involved, we're engaged, um, and it is an equal partnership. I mean, that would be something that to me would make more sense than not that sort of suggesting we're going to um, champion that, that uh, effort. But to me, that would make more sense at least. And also, as Danny said, not as you know, the county being the overseeing or, or you know, involved with the paperwork aspect of it that can be cumbersome, I'm sure, and, and difficult to manage. Uh, but those, those are some of the, the concerns that I have. Um, and, and again, I know getting six businesses here is one thing. What we do with them when they're here is a you know, much different thing. Uh, you know, you get them here and they look around and nobody tries to actually, you know, one of those nasty car salesmen, if we don't close the deal, sorry, um, then, then that effort is wasted. And I understand there's strengths and there's weaknesses on both teams, if you will. Um, but again, I think there is a duplication and maybe we're not getting the value for the investment that, that uh, if, if, if I could, just, just a second. Yeah, yeah. Because, um, what I'd like to do, uh, one of the original concepts from the board when we used the original presentation was doubling down on the thing. We believed at the time, and I still believe that way, so healthy competition is good to be able to do businesses in the community. So, and I, I still have that uh, belief that competition is what's going to drive this goal. The, the, uh, what that competition looks like, because I think it's part of what we're talking about right here today, uh, with Mark's presentation. But what I'd like to do at this point in time is a lot of business leaders that came in today that with the potential expectation that they'll say a few words. And I know it's unusual, we don't normally go down that road during these types of uh, staff meetings. Uh, however, with your permission, I'd like to allow some of them to make the comments. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Is that you all right? Okay. Mark, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to you. Sure. Yeah. And I would like to address each of those points that you guys brought up. And I do agree with you that I really <coughs> respect the time of the <coughs> here. And I agree with you. Okay. And I think Derek, maybe had the first next appointment, it started at 10 o'clock, so we'd like to come to the next one. And for the record, if you would, I mean, we all know each other. Yes, but please, but for the record, because it's all being recorded, for name, address, uh, who you are. Yep. What do you represent? Yes, sir. Um, I'm Derek Davis. I'm the CEO of Sky Financial 229 North Barclay Street, in the of Oregon. Uh, we moved up here 12 years ago from Palo Alto. We moved our corporate office up here uh, five years ago into Medford. Um, recently added uh, June Lee, who's a 403B, 401k specialist, and we're moving up our municipality and corporate offices from Palo Alto later this year. All of our corporate services, whether they're, uh, we provide them for Santa Clara County or the City of Palo Alto or Ronald McDonald House, will all be serviced out of Palo Alto here. Uh, at the end of this year, we'll have a little over $2 billion of assets in the management. A lot of those assets are through get allotted to alternative investing, which you know more of angel investing and such like that. Um, we have a, a network of startup companies in the Bay Area, and that's why Mark probably addressed us, that um, we're early, early uh, investors in. 
those companies and we have the ability to guide them um, hopefully to up to Southern Oregon. There's certain prospects, low hanging fruit if you will. So that's uh, we'll continue working on that with Mark and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm, I'm, my industry is a lot better at listening than just speaking, so I'm kind of short. So. One of the things I am looking for, if it's, it's okay to the is why you, yeah, obviously you came here to support me. Yes, sir. And why you believe that this, this program, you know, these proposals, proposal, why that should be considered. I, I'm, I'm, we, we are, I appreciate the background, but I would like to understand your opinion on what you Yes, sir. I, I, I've been on the, well, I guess relocation committees where we've been flown to different cities to look at um, moving corporate headquarters there. And to have a key person like that in the um, county um, in southern Oregon is, is key, I believe. Um, when Dr. Kim came up without Mark's guidance, she may have been lost as far as who to speak to. Um, we've been trying to grow for five years and I've still not met Ron Fox. Um, he's returned one of my calls, um, but I do get some sort of property tax uh, rebate from him, so I appreciate that. I got a form letter and mail a couple of days ago. I got a couple of forms, but um, I believe Mark or a key person like Mark is essential for the county in being able to address these companies that are out there looking. One, you have to invite them, um, and if you can get them to come visit, you know, <coughs> they quality of life. You know, we talked to a couple of boys from Russia and wanted to raise them here in Mount Palo Alto. And um, it's a wonderful place to live if you can figure out how to make a living. Can I ask you, you recently moved a company to five years to be the yes, sir. What, big, what was one of the key factors that made you make that decision? Obviously, you didn't have somebody like Mark to help you get to this point. Uh, what, what, what was your... A combination of two things. In, in, having been based in, in Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, the cost of employment are a lot greater for staff down there, and the loyalty of the people up here. Everybody that we have right now, I believe, will probably end up retiring in Sky Oak, their family. Down there, if, if they were with Sky Oak, and, and a startup company said, hey, we're starting up myfavoritewebsite.com, come on board, they may, they may jump. And so to be able to train people at the level of, of investing that we try to train them at, um, we have a much more loyal um, client base up here. A lot of our, our employees here have moved from the Bay Area or have moved from outside of the area because of the education level needed to do what we do. Um, but as far as support staff, you know, we can teach them and, and um, you know, our office manager, our troop chief operating officer, they're going to die of sky with people uh, 30 years later. And um, I don't, you get more of a family sense down there where it's, it's much more corporate down, down there. It's a different quality of people up here. I could add one thing. The event that we had in Medford Higher Education Center, Gary was one of the people that attended that event, and then subsequently he went down to the Bay Area, which I, again I think was historic. We had an event, the CEO's home, 10,000 square foot home, 26 acre gate of the state, with 150 people at that event. There and a number of people in this room were also there. So he was able to observe that and, uh, and, and realize what we're, what we're doing. That CEO, by the way, just closed on a 276 acre state in the afternoon. So it's not smoke of the ears and wishful thinking. They're actually very, very interested, and it's in large part because of the, the environment that we've created for them to, to welcome them and to make a connection for them. I would, I would think it would be great, no matter who brings uh, potential business here, to talk to folks out there. I mean, that's a story that I think needs to be heard. Again, no matter the source of who uh, got it. And, and, and we're happy to help whomever uh, in, in Jackson. Yes, yeah, so if you have time, and I know it's difficult to get information across, I would like to spend some time with you and take your brain. Of course, you know, my, um, my office is definitely a hotel. Thank you. So. And, and you'll have to excuse me. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your taking time. Thank you. Of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. And now it's your show. So. I know it's next, next person on the plane schedule. Excuse me, I come at this from a little different perspective. I moved down here in 84. Worst recession since the Great Depression, public purple, just got out of. And um, the concern that I have had has been the disappearance of our kids who excel in the schools and are not coming back unless they come back to the family business um, or their doctors or um, they, they're 
financial advisors. And, and they usually come back in the early 30s, that's what I see. Um, I think that's a quality of life issue for one thing, but it's also about trying to motivate young people to be excited about learning and having momentum going forward. And so, um, as and my role the last uh, decade that I served on the uh, Royal Valley Workforce Development Council, uh, went to chamber meetings, I uh, heard numerous presentations from Soleil, and the concern that I have had is that I have not seen, with all the limitations we have, their quality and movement towards industries that would maximize the limited the, the limit that we have for, for jobs that would pay more than uh, the they are. That is a, a quality of life piece. Um, our poverty rate in our community has doubled since I've been here in terms of kids that qualify for free or free we, We've got a great story to tell. We just haven't told it. And I believe that other people have the confidence in me more than I have in myself. These guys sharpen my iron and they, they, they fuel my tank to say, you know what, we can do this. And they believe that we can do it. And I believe if, you, if, I, didn't, if I wasn't as passionate about it and if I wasn't as determined, would you want me in this position? Right? So it's an unproven commodity for our community, but I'm asking you for a quarter at a time. It's a, it's a $15,000 quarter at a time. Measure my performance. If I'm not doing what I said I would do, you'll know right away. Yeah, just going back to the question I had about it. We were equal equal partner, which at this point, I don't know what their individual investors are, but they average twenty four thousand. I mean, is that enough of a stake that it, it gets you going, it gets you uh, able to be viable and out there doing what you need to do? And then we, you know, again, this is just me talking. I'm talking. Uh, then we adjust as we go. We start seeing you know, good results, and then it looks like a good investment. Um, but at, like I said, at this point, if that's if that's what the average stakeholder is uh, is putting into this, it seems like. I would feel more comfortable being on that same uh, playing field. I would probably, you know, do that rather than do nothing. But from my perspective, we have a mindset of, of, of scarcity that prevails in our community, and we're, you know, we're not going to get what we're not paying for. There's, there's certain tools that I need, and originally Jackson County and the concept of coming to the county, Commissioner Brian Ball and his comment about competition was spot on. Uh, I'm going to circle back and address that real quick. But the competition about comp uh, the com the conversation about competition, which was brought up by Commissioner Biden Ball in the original presentation, is spot on. For the first time, and I'm not here representing Sir Lady, I resigned from the board in, uh, you know, in November, but, but that competition is a good thing all day. For the first time in 12 years of having these business conferences, so Southern Business Conference, for the first time, this one was about technology. That's never happened before. Okay? So for the first time, now they're talking about recruiting tech businesses. That's never happened before. So that competition is already a good thing. So the original proposal was based on Jackson County coming in third, and it would be more effective to help me get the tools that I need to actually do this so that I'm not impoverished if the, if the county would come in at a third. And what Danny had proposed originally was stepping that up, like if we start off at 180 and Jackson County is a third of that, stepping that up as additional stakeholders come and there's additional traction. And that'll give me the more effective tools that I need to do the job. I'm looking at this for options and exploring that. Understood, understood, yeah. respected. We've been at this now for almost an hour. And so I'm going to start wrapping this up. Sure. And I do appreciate all the people taking the time out of the day and talking and giving us uh, comments on your proposal and in support of that. And, and I don't want to be disrespectful of anything I have to say that they so good for supporting. But you do make a good comment on accountability and on the performance metrics that I would be doing. And I think that's kind of what we're doing here today. The original proposal is one thing. The secondary proposal is a, third, a second issue. We're now on the third proposal, and we're looking at accountability because the proposals themselves have yet to be able to be materialized. This is basically that home sale that hasn't been able to go through at this point in time. And a lot of real experience, I use that analogy, otherwise I said that we use cars. Um, no offense, Rick, and Commissioner, I didn't, so, I didn't mean to submit a second. I didn't. I don't think I submitted a second proposal. It was kind of a fluid discussion from that first until today. This is the third meeting we've had from the third meeting for a session of commissioners to be able to decide what we're going to do. First one was on the freeway school. The second was to allow more than three investors, and then the third one is how to reduce the level. And you know, what I was, uh, what I would like to ask the commissioner to consider here. Is this, this is a moving target like I alluded to earlier. Um, I would like to take 
take this and send it to our economic development committee. And this is just my personal recommendation to the board and let them vet the process out. Uh, this is a little more a little more complicated than what was originally discussed. There's a lot of pieces, a lot of a lot of people in the community that are involved here. The economic development committee is a lot of our business leaders. And uh, and maybe they can vet this out a little bit for us and then bring back a uh, more refined proposal. So we know if we're looking at Stephen today with your presentation, and as well as it is, I'm not exactly sure exactly how you want to structure the contracts, the partners, and the relationships between the county and our other partners. Uh, like I told you in the past, um, the county and these partners have to have equal shares, equal responsibility and equal risk and liability. So it's not the taxpayer dollar being lost. If it's a partnership, the public dollar, the private dollar is being lost at the same time as the public dollar. So, uh, and nobody is receiving public dollars outside of uh, being funneled back somewhere that it's inappropriate. So that's my recommendation to this board is to let's vet this out of the further work on the development committee. Uh, and at some point, I'd like to see it go by the uh, budget committee as well. They right. seemed most interested before. I'm looking at part of that. Well, it's certainly, is, that certainly is part of the budget process. The way we have portions of our budget for economic and special development, and we put a number in there. And I don't want to do anything too hastily or move too quickly, uh, but I do, I do appreciate that there is a sense of getting things moving. Um, right now. Well, I understand, and, and again, you know, we don't want to be pushed to where we're doing something that's you know, responsible, but I do appreciate the fact that there is some uh, time consideration here that we need to be sensitive to. So, uh, you know, those two committees looking this over, if we need some time frame that that can be accomplished. Well, uh, I will say this, and you are the liaison to the economic development committee. I'm not sure we discussed that. So I, I think that time frame would be your ability to move that forward. And the budget committee, uh, we have a process currently underway and we're convening that budget committee here shortly. Thank you. So I don't think that uh, next month is actually a budget committee. So there's an after process here. Uh, Mark, I, 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 I hope you can firm this up with the economic, if this is okay, uh, concept. Yes. Okay. I would I encourage you to get to know the economic development committee, uh, refine your presentation so that it's clean, it's concise, uh, accurate, and depicting the reality, especially with the case to the new poker dollars and some of the things that uh, Mr. Jordan discussed earlier. Putting validity to it is, is critical. And I think as we move forward, if we want the deal to come together, I think having that, uh, that strong sense is, is accomplishable. And you are the person to do it. One thing I do understand here and see is that everybody agrees that something is going to and the one thing that we do know is if we continue to go down where we're at, we're going to continue to get what we have. And if we do nothing, we know the outcome is doing nothing. Doing something and where we're going, what that vessel looks like is the question that we really have right now. Are we the right captain for this particular boat that we're coming out of the So I think that's what we need to work with the current development committee with and, and sort of get this out. Thank you very much, Mark. We need to take a five-minute recess. Uh, no, we're we're going to go ahead. We're going to take a five-minute recess uh, of this meeting at this point in time. It's uh, 11 o'clock, and we'll reconvene at 11 o'clock.